Good morning, and welcome again to another uh, edition, uh, I believe, of the Sunday Sermon Series here with the Higher Grounds Podcast. Uh, I appreciate these men uh, who are continuing to help us uh, to get a good word in, and uh, I know we're having to do things different uh, because of COVID-19, and uh, this uh, schedules have been changed, service times have been changed, and uh, but I'm grateful for churches and, and meetings and things that are still happening uh, to help feed God's people. And so I'm very uh, grateful for this opportunity uh, today and uh, to, to be able to bring you a thought, and I pray that it'll be a help, be a blessing to you. If you will, I'd like for you to take your Bible with us and go to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy in chapter number eight will be our text verse. As a matter of fact, I'm really not going to read just one passage. Normally, I'd read a passage and pray, um, but I want to just dive into a, a text today and uh, give you some things that God's made very fresh on my heart. Uh, I got plenty of outlines and those kinds of things, but this is what's just real good and fresh, and I pray to be a help and be a blessing to you. Pray for us uh, here uh, at uh, HGP. We want to be a blessing to you uh, during this time. And we're praying for you all. Thank you for the encouraging text and words and uh, people following and visiting and uh, listening in. And we want to be a help to you during this time. Deuteronomy chapter number 8 uh, will be our text verses and our, and our chapter that we're going to be in. We're going to walk through this chapter together. So I invite you to open your Bible and walk with us. When you come to Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, you're in a, a, a season uh, of chapters uh, in which uh, Moses now realizing that his, I believe, realizing his days are numbered. Uh, he realizes he's brought the people of God as far as he is going to be able to bring them. And as he does that, uh, Deuteronomy, uh, the book of Deuteronomy, really, uh, he gives them commands. Now, if you walk through the book of Deuteronomy, uh, there are some what we would be familiar commands about things that are eat, not eat. But he really gets very specific with them about some things that they should not do. And when you read them, you think, my goodness, why would anybody have to be told that? Seemingly, it's common sense. But you got to remember, uh, he's bringing people uh, that have come out of Egypt, and now uh, those generations are dying off, and now this new generation is coming on. And God has given him these commands uh, because he doesn't desire them to repeat the life of an Egyptian. And we know that once you're saved, once we come out of Egypt, uh, we're not to live the life of an Egyptian, those that are in the world. We live a new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to look at some things that he told them, and I believe that we can make application uh, not just in our daily life, but even during these times uh, of um, difficult times, I guess would be a way of saying that. Now, I want you to look with me in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse number 1. I want you to notice, first of all, that he deals with the subject of obedience. He said in chapter 8, verse 1, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe and do. Now, God does not... Uh, put any filler words on our Bible. Uh, he didn't put anything in there just uh, so it would take up space. Uh, but God means what he says. God says what he means. And so he's telling the people of God when it comes to the subject of obedience, he doesn't want them obeying half the commandments. His desire is that they obey them all. Child of God, God is not giving us suggestions about living the Christian life. Uh, when God says, thou shalt not kill, we, we agree there. Obviously, it is a sin to murder, and we shouldn't do that. But the same God that said, thou shalt not kill, also said, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal. And so he's telling them that what I give you, I don't want you to pick and choose as to what you're going to believe, what you're going to live by. Uh, I want you to take the Word of God as the whole. It is God's Word. You say, well, I don't know how I feel about this. It's God's Word whether you believe it or not. And so he tells them to obey that. Now, let me move on. He said, and he said, by doing that, it's going to produce something that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. Now, the book of Deuteronomy also gives them uh, daily uh, or chapter by chapter this, uh, this choice. Matter of fact, he says in chapter 30, I believe verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you. I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. He reminds them that you're a creature of choice. I'm a creature of choice. I've got a choice to make. And the choice that God is trying to make simple for them is this. I want you to choose 
to obey me. Now, God's not going to make you obey, but he will make you wish you had obeyed. I believe it was Dr. Percy Ray who preached that great message, God won't make you, but he'll make you wish you had. And so that's what God's given us here in this text. And he said, and when you do obey, God is saying, I've, I've got blessings for you. I've got something that I want to give you. So let's consider the rest of the verse, and that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. He said, when you obey my word, it is going to produce some good things in the life of a believer, obeying God's word. I wrote this down, that obedience produces success and it produces progress. Now, I got saved at 14 years old. I'm now 38. I'm just a couple of months so, uh, from turning 39. Uh, been saved now for almost 25 years. Uh, best life a person can live is living for God. But I want to tell you, from 14 years old to 38, that God has blessed my life when I obey Him, when I obey His Word. And when you don't know how to feel, and when you don't know what to do, and when your emotions try to turn you in so many different ways, this is from the young person all the way up to the mature Christian. Uh, I'm telling you, God will bless those who obey Him. So God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you success, and then I'm going to have progress going forward. Uh, church, we're, we're in some difficult days, and we're in some days where it seems like weekly... Uh, our men of God are having to make choices about what to do next. But God always brings progress when we choose to obey the Word of God. So he, he just gives us a good command about God's Word. I want to, I want to dive into verse 2 through verse number 4 a little bit. And he, he wants them to remember how faithful God's been. All right, look with me again. Deuteronomy 8, verse number 2. And we're going to see a familiar phrase that comes all the way through the book of Deuteronomy, but is found many times just in this chapter. And thou shalt remember. Now, what does God want us to remember? What is God telling them to remember? All the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years. I want you to remember. He's so specific. I want you to re even remember the way in which I chose to lead you 40 years in the wilderness. And he said, I had a purpose behind that. I wasn't leading you uh, just because I take joy out of your hardship. Listen, child of God, I know sometimes we take the martyr's mentality or the woe is me or it sound like a rerun of hee-haw, you know, uh, woe and despair and agony on me. Um, but he, he's telling us, I did this for a couple of reasons. Number one, I did it to humble thee. And we need that. We need to be humble. We need a humbleness toward God Almighty to humble thee. And to prove thee, he said, I wanted to prove you. I wanted to see how much you trust me, how far you go with me. I wanted to weed some things out of you. And then, watch this, to know what was in thy heart. Now, God knows what's in my heart. God knows me better than I know me. He said, but I took you this way so that I could show you that when you get your way, you will be disobedient. If I got my way and if we get our way, we'll not choose right. But when we choose God's way, God's way is always right. So he said, I led you that way. I want you to remember that, whether that would us keep his commandments or no. Verse 3, and he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna. The same God that humbled, the same God that let them be hungry is the same God that produced manna in the wilderness. So God was working on both sides. Sometimes we say, I don't know why God done this. Well, his ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. But if I'll be patient, God knows the end. He knows the, he knows the, the middle. And he also, we know that he sees the beginning, which thou knewest not, neither did thy father know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Now, we know the Lord Jesus Christ is going to use these scriptures when he's overcome in temptation. And if Jesus used them, then you and I can too. Well, how do I use that verse? What are you talking about using it? That there's going to be times in my life, whether it is today, whether it's down the road, whether it's in adversity, whether it's growing in the Christian life, we have the temptation to question God whether or not God knows what he's doing. And God, I tell you this child of God, you may not know everything God's doing, but God knows what he's doing. He said, I let you hunger so that I could feed you. And by you hungering, you saw how faithful I am. Sometimes God lets me and my family go through something just for the purpose of showing them how faithful God is. And to the young people that are listening in, to mamas and daddies, that during this time, it's so important 
that we let them see, you know, really maybe in our lives, this is some of the first time that we've encountered this type of thing in our country. Well, they need to know that God is more than just what we talk about, but he's a real God. He's a good God and that he is a God that can be faithful. Pastor preached yesterday at the church about that faith and about growing faith. And buddy, the church uh, is needs to be a champion of faith during these days by the power of God. Verse four, now we're still talking about how uh, how faithful God had been. Now, I get this, and I know you, maybe you'll disagree right here, and that'll be completely fine. But in verse 4, he said, Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. I, I kind of take the mentality that they probably didn't even realize, hey, wait a minute, we've never had to replace our shoes, we've never had to replace our raiment. Uh, I, I don't know about y'all, but I I, uh, I like that kind of thing during the, during these days that we're in. Be a blessing not to have to buy any new shoes or new clothes. God's just helping these things expand. Uh, I don't know, but I kind of wonder if God is pointing this out the way He did because they didn't even realize it. They didn't even realize how faithful God has been. Could I say this? I know that right now our thrust is this: God, please help our nation and deliver us in this time of a, of a virus or a sickness that we really don't understand. But while we're waiting for God to work that miracle, don't forget about the miracles that God's working every day in your house. That while we're waiting on things to change, waiting on things to get better if they ever do, there's a miracle that God is taking good care of us. I always refer to this. In the book of Mark, chapter number 4, the disciples are on the ship. They're, they're, uh, the, the waves begin to beat. The ship's now full. And the Bible tells us that that ship, though it was full of water, God was keeping them afloat. Brother Terry Deitch said this, I'm glad to be serving a God that can keep you floating while you're full. The miracle that they're waiting on, they're waiting on Jesus to calm the water. They're waiting on Jesus to come in and waiting on him uh, to, to, to calm that raging sea. But while they're looking for that miracle, God's working more miracles. Uh, God's keeping the church doors open. God's putting food on your table. Uh, God's keeping the bills paid. God's keeping the lights on. God's protecting you. So don't overlook those miracles uh, while you're waiting on God to do the other. God was helping their clothes to stretch out, their feet to stretch out, their food to stretch out while they're waiting on God to take them into the promised land. So there, once again, he reminds them of God's faithfulness. And when he gets to verse 5 through verse number 9, keep walking with me now, now he wants to deal with that intimate relationship. Look at the intimacy. He said in verse 5, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart, that as a man chasteneth his son. So God said, this is how I want you to know that you're my child. As a man chasteneth his son. Now we know this, uh, that according to John chapter 1, the many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. I am his child. He's referring to the people of God. He said, I, I chastened you the way that a father would chasten his son. He said, I didn't take pleasure out of chastising you just to do it. I've, I've got one son. Uh, many of you know my son, Seth. He's a little bit crazy and uh, gets that from his, from his mama's side. Say amen right there. And, uh, but uh, my son, Seth, uh, he is, he's 15, he'll be 16 in May. I've never enjoyed just, you know, getting up one day and I was in a good mood. You know, somebody said, don't whip your kids when you're mad. I think that's very good advice, but I've never just gotten up in a good mood and said, hey, I think I'm just going to whip my son. Um, but uh, God is saying, I had a purpose behind that chastisement. You notice what he said, thou should also consider in thy heart that as a man chasten his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. In other words, as a father chastens, God said, I chastised you. I disciplined you, but I had a purpose in mind. In my life, when God chastises his people, there's a purpose in mind. I, I believe this. I'm not always the guy who stands back and says, yep, uh, America's being judged or this person's being judged. Got to be very careful of that. But I will say this, that God knows how to humble America. God knows how to deal with his church. But specifically, God knows how to deal with you and I. Why? Because he is my father, as a father chasteneth his son. And we know this, that according to Hebrews chapter number 12, I believe it is, um, Brother Matt had to help me there, but according to Hebrews chapter number 12, he reminds us that when God disciplines us, it is a proof that I belong to him. I don't want to have to go out this chastisement. I don't want to sin. I don't want to fail him. But that's proof. And God 
God's saying that the reason I chastise you, I've got a purpose. I want you to be clean. I want you to be right. I want you to be close to me. Verse number six, therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. He said, now, as you begin making this march toward the promised land, he said, I want, I want you to have a fear for me. And we live in a day and a time where nobody has any fear for God. And that's one thing if the crowd down at the bar or the crowd in our political venues do that. But I'm a child of God. I am to have a fear and a reverence and a respect for Him. And that doesn't make me afraid of Him. That makes me love Him. That makes me want to be around Him. That makes me want to enjoy Him. Let's keep moving along. This is the intimacy, and we'll get where we're going. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, fountains and deeps that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat, barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olive and honey. A land wherein thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. What he's reminding them is this. He's that you're going to reap blessings from places that you have not sown in. Now, I'm going to tell you, I believe God blesses the works of our hands. I believe God, no doubt, takes care of his people. When you work and you labor, Brother Andy several days ago did that morning minute meditation about uh, prospering and about laboring and about preparing, and I believe you should do that. But you have to agree with me, every one of us, we have some blessings that we didn't earn, we don't deserve, uh, but God has been good to us. God has shown us favor in the fact of how he's taken care of us. Yes, there's clo there's food on our table. Uh, yes, there's uh, there's clothes on our back, and those kind of necessities. But I'm telling you, God's been good to us. Most of us, they have a car. You may have two cars. Uh, God's blessed us in the home that we live, and so there's so many blessings. And we didn't get those things. I'm reminded of what David said. He said, "Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever." So He's reminding them of those blessings they have. They don't deserve. I don't deserve what God's given to me. God's been good to us. And then he said this, the way that God blessed you, he blessed you without scarceness. In other words, you look around and there are times we wonder, you know, where's the next blessing going to come from? But I'm telling you, when I think about the bigness of God, it is without scarceness. I know God's going to take care of his people. And then here's what he said in verse 10. He said, when thou hast eaten, now I want you to, as we dial this thing in, I want you to notice the references to time that he's going to give. Almost a cause and effect. When thou hast eaten and art full, then what do I do? What do I do when I've been full? What do I do when God's blessed me? I want you to notice what he says we're to do. He said, when thou hast eaten and art full, then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given thee. I want you to be honest with me today. How long has it been since we paused in the middle of panic or paused in the middle of it? We have asked God and we've asked God and we've interceded. But how many of us have faithfully said, Lord, I want to thank you for being good to me. And that is the sin or that is the problem that he's dealing with in this chapter. Now let's get down to verse 11. He said, beware. Now, what is this beware coming from? When thou hast eaten, then thou shalt bless the Lord. That, problem is that, that uh, same thought continues. He said, beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. Now, let's think about what he's saying. He's saying, when that happens, don't forget God. I mean, that's a pretty, isn't it an amazing thing. Why would God have to tell us that? Now, you remember everything in the Scripture God tells us, he tells us because it doesn't come natural. It, it's not natural for a man to love his wife, so God tells us that. It's not natural for a woman to submit to her husband because those aren't natural. So when God gives a command, he's saying it's going to be a natural thing for you and I to forget the blesser, for you and I to forget God. Now, we're living day and hour. We are to be daily spending time thanking God for being so good to us. So here's what he said. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I commanded this day. He said, when you come into this land, he said, make sure you don't forget about me. Don't forget who brought you thus far. Don't, don't forget who has fed you and taken care of you. Let's, let's go ahead and make, make, a, make a promise uh, vocally and in our heart. 
We're believing God wonderful if two months from now things are completely turned around and things are better and we go about business as usual. But there should be a drive. I've talked to so many people from our church. Man, I can't wait to get back to the house of God. I can't wait to get our church family back together. I can't wait. Oh, I I pray that fuels us in revival and a desire and a love back for Him. Let's move on and I'll I'll give you the thoughts. He said, he said, when? He said, beware. Look at verse 14. Or verse 12, lest when thou hast eaten art full, and hast built goodly houses and dwell therein. Notice the timing. And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thou hast is multiplied. Verse 14, then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Think about what he's saying. He's saying, please, please don't forget me. Uh, I remember I got married uh, February the 3rd, 2001, being able to remember that without looking at anything. They already get me some good brownie points there. And when I think about when I got married, I'll never forget uh, the late Dr. Roy Goodson uh, had a part in our, in, our, in our wedding. And Brother Roy Goodson said this. He said, what are you so excited about? And I remember I said, I'm just excited about the fact of it being me and it being her and we're starting our life together and it's just going to be me and her. And he said, don't ever forget that. He said, never to live a day as if the other didn't exist. That, that's what God is pleading to his people. Don't live your life as if we never existed. Love me. Live for me. Keep me first in life. Young people... You know, we think about the youth camps, and we think about the youth meetings, and we think about what God's done. Some of you have had great rearing in your life. God has brought you up in this Christian home. God's bless you. Don't, don't come into your teenage years and forget about God. Don't, don't come into, um, uh, you know, as a, even in your early married life. Don't, 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 forget, don't forget about the God that's taking good care of you. I, I think about some of the young people that's coming through our camps and, you know, they're coming through and they've had talent, all those things, and giving it to God. And then they go out and it's almost as if they put God on a shelf for a while and it doesn't take them long to realize there is no success when you leave God out. And can I say this? There'll be no success if we do that. Let me give you a few things. Then in verse 17, uh, we're, we're talking about forgetting God. You say, how do I forget him? Well, when you and I make plans without God, we're forgetting him. We just make plans. We just go about our day, go about our life. You know, we make all these plans, and then we try to find somewhere to stick God in. That's forgetting about Him. When you and I forsake the prayer closet, we're forgetting about God. Every good gift coming from above. We're we're communicating. We're praying. We ought to pray always. Pray without ceasing. And uh, by the grace of God. And, And when we forsake the prayer closet, we're forgetting God. When we refuse to praise Him, we're forgetting God. Uh, when we fail to consider His Word and we live our life and we never look at what the pages of the Word of God say, we're forgetting about God. Don't forget God. Now notice the warning He gives, and I'm going to wind her down. He said, And thou shalt say in thine heart, My power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. My goodness, where would we be without Him? If we got left to our wealth, Brother Matt, if we got left to what our hands could do, We'd have made shipwreck a long time ago. We, we'd be a mess. We wouldn't be here today. But I'm telling you, if we got left to ourselves, aren't you glad God did not leave us to ourselves? I'm glad God don't leave us alone. God didn't, I don't have to worry about trying to figure out how and what and when. No, I got to keep my heart right with God and keep him first and obey his command. And God always takes care of his people. And here's what he said. He said, when thou shalt say in the heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. Verse 18, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for he it is that giveth thee power. So I don't know if I'm going to make it or not. I'm telling you, you're going to make it. And why are you going to make it? It's because it's not by your power. It's because of his power. To get well that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. God keeps going on and on and on and telling them, I'm going to take care of you and I'm going to hold up my part. I'm going to remember you. I say, what does God think about? God thinks about you and I. God helped me not to forget him. Not just... Not just when things are in question like they are now. Not just when we're wondering, when's our next service going to be? Not just when we're wondering, you know, how, how we're going to make it through. How are this going to get paid? How's that going to get taken care of? When am I going to get sick and all those things? Not just then. But I'm talking about months from now. When things turn, maybe turn back to a sense of, you know, normalcy. 
I don't want to forget God. I want to remember the hunger that I have for him right now for the things of God, the Word of God, and for God's family. Thank you so much for coming by today for this Sunday. So, it's been a blessing to you. Don't forget God. In Jesus' name, amen.